Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If you've been following me for a very long time, you are probably familiar with this video. This is my uh, visualization of how asteroids have been discovered over the last uh, few decades. You see, back in the 90s, I was a researcher actually looking at asteroids and their potential hazard to the Earth, and I figured out a way to, you know, visualize this data in a cool way. And it was apparently cool enough that a yeah, million people viewed it, which was a big deal back when I had nobody watching me on YouTube. Now, before the mid-90s, there weren't really any telescopes that were specifically looking to catalogue and discover asteroids. So we had like 25,000 asteroids known by the middle of the 1990s. But a few years later, suddenly we have these dedicated survey telescopes, things like like the Lincoln Near-Earth Asteroid Research Telescope in White Sands, New Mexico, which suddenly exploded the number of asteroids that were being discovered. So anyway, this animation of mine was what sort of got me in touch with the B612 Foundation, which was a non-profit taking donors' money to essentially help protect the world from the, the possibility of an asteroid hitting it. And in the last few years, they've been funding uh, researchers, and this week they made a big announcement that they have discovered 27,500 asteroids in data which really wasn't set up for asteroid discovery. And they did this in two ways. First of all, they used copious quantities of cheap, available cloud computing power that we can now get for, you know, subscription fees. But they also used a completely new algorithm called Thor, which can use all that computing power to find asteroids and data sets that are really not amenable to asteroid discovery you know, searches. So I kind of want to talk about this. So as you probably know, asteroids are small planets in the solar system. We call them minor planets. There's also dwarf planets, which are bigger, and regular planets, which are you know more important. But minor planets, there's a lot of them. And most of them exist between Mars and Jupiter in the asteroid belt. The first asteroid discovered was Ceres in January 1st, 1801. And the name asteroid comes from aster, you know, ancient Greek for star-like, and oid, meaning an object. So these were small points that could not be resolved into a planetary disk like you could with the regular planets, and yet they were seen to move like planets. Now, to discover an asteroid, it's not enough to just get one photograph of it, because that just tells you that there was something there and, you know, a couple of days later it's gone. You actually need to have multiple photos off the same object over time and you need to be able to make a trail, map that into an orbit, and then using that orbit, you know that there's no other asteroids with that those orbital elements, therefore this is a new object. Once it's been observed long enough, it gets a number, and if you're cool, you get a chance to name it. So for example, a small asteroid discovered in 1971 was eventually given the number 2309, and then in 1985, the discoverer got to name it Mr. Spock. That's obviously named after his pet cat because they didn't allow uh, you to name asteroids after fictional characters at the time. But since then, they've relaxed the rules somewhat. And we do have asteroids named for Sherlock, Watson, Moriarty, Arthur Dent. And of course, asteroid 9007 is known as Bond, James Bond. Yeah, Sean Connery did that so much better. So anyway, B612, Asteroid Institute, they've been working on tools for managing huge amounts of asteroid discoveries. And one of the interesting tools that they launched a couple of years ago was the pre-covery service where you could go in and you give the orbital parameters or give a specific asteroid and it would look through a bunch of astronomical databases and see if it could find older images of an object. And that can be really good if you are, say, trying to nail down a specific orbit, or if, say, you have an asteroid named after you and you want to find some pictures of it. And before you all go rushing to do this, uh, please don't, because it'll probably cost them a bunch of money. So a key part to asteroid discovery is orbit determination. So if you take an image of an asteroid in the sky, it's just a point in the sky, and you know where it is, what direction it is, but you don't know how far away it is or how far it's moving. Now, if you take a second one, you think, aha, now I know how fast it's moving, but not quite because you don't know the distance still. And there's actually an infinite number of solutions between two different uh, observation vectors. 
But if you take a third image, then now you have enough data to constrain it and you just need an algorithm that will connect the three points. So Newton was one of the first, he figured out a way of doing it for parabolic objects because he was interested in comet. Gauss had created what's called Gauss's method and that was sort of one of the ones that was most used up, well, it was still being taught when I was at university. Now, three positions is the minimum. It's not going to get you a great orbit. And the more positions you add and the longer your observing arc, the better your orbit is going to get. So in the early 1800s, astronomers would calculate the orbits of asteroids by looking through a telescope and carefully noting down the coordinates. Over time, you started to get uh, you know, photographic capability, so you could just read them off the images. And by the time the 90s rolled around, of course, you had optoelectric imaging. But being able to efficiently image the sky means that you start seeing lots of moving objects and that in itself causes another problem. One of the important things that the dedicated asteroid discovery surveys did was that they made it easy to connect the dots from one night to another. So if you imagine you take a picture of some section of the sky and you find like a thousand points in there that aren't stars, and then you take the same picture couple of days later, and you see about a thousand points. Which ones go to which ones is complicated. There's like a million possible combinations, not including the ones that are coming in from outside the frame and the ones that have left the frame. But it is a, a problem to actually map these back and forth and actually figure out which orbits are viable. So to make it easy to connect from one day to the next, instead of taking one photo a night, you would actually take two photos a night, perhaps separated by maybe an hour or 45 minutes. And that way you would have two images of the object close together, showing the velocity they had within that frame. And that meant when you were linking things forward, it was a whole lot easier because it really constrained your search area. So these closely spaced pairs of observation were called tracklets. So that's great if your survey is specifically looking for moving objects like asteroids. But if your survey is doing something else, say it's just photographing the sky and looking for supernova, new bright sources, it's problematic if you want to take the same shot of the same area twice every night because it means you have to slew your telescope to each location twice. And that means it's spending more time moving, less time imaging. And one such data set is the Dark Energy Survey Camera. This is a fantastic data set if you're looking at supernova or variability or, you know, stars even, because stars move across the sky with their proper motion, but that's measured at a different cadence. To look at, for small, fast-moving objects, that was not really possible. Until Thor came along, and that is an algorithm developed by people working with the Astro Asteroid Institute. Uh, Thor is an acronym for tracklet less heliocentric orbit recovery. So tracklet less means that we they don't actually need the tracklets and so they can use data sets that don't have them. Heliocentric means, well, they're looking for orbits around the sun. And orbit recovery, well, that's because you're trying to recover orbits so you can identify those asteroids and, hey, you know, get the cool names and numbers on them. Now, the main innovation here is that it basically it tries to reduce the amount of search space that you would have to do from a brute force search. And so it brings it into the range that's possible with significant amounts of computing power. Basically, you start with your points and then you say, well, what if it was in this orbit? Figure out where it might be. And as you adjust those orbits, you start to see the correlations line up. And if you have like six points that all fall along your test orbit, you're pretty sure that you have an asteroid, which is a new discovery. And I guess a key part is knowing which orbits are worth testing for an object in a given location in the sky. So other things they did with this computing power was using you know, AI, image recognition. They trained it on finding asteroids using humans, and then it was able to go in and find candidate objects and then feed that into the system and get that all indexed automatically. And then by applying the Thor algorithm against this huge set of data points, they could start guessing the orbits and seeing which ones linked up. And if they got enough objects or enough observations linking into a trail, they could say, this is a good discovery. So yeah, this is 27,500 objects, mainly main belt asteroids, which have been discovered in an old data set. This is the kind of science you can do when you have lots of computing power to apply to a lot of old data. 
There is a huge amount of scientific data available online uh, basically for free and it was used by one set of researchers to answer some question but just because it was used for one question doesn't mean that it has given up all its secrets and if you have the motivation and the ideas and the understanding you can go into this old data and you can pull out new ideas. You know, when People at college say, hey, I really want to be an astronomer. What telescope should I get? I, I tell them, it's like, if you really want to be an astronomer, you should actually just go and download data from space probes or Hubble Space Telescope, learn to process and learn to make pretty pictures and or answer questions with it. You might be skeptical, but I know one fine gentleman who, you know, he doesn't have a science degree, but he was really interested in NASA stuff. He would download data, make images, post them on the forums, and he now drives Mars rovers. I mean, don't get me wrong, looking through telescopes can be cool, but it's not what astronomers do as a job generally. But coming back to what B612 and the Asteroid Institute are doing here, I mean, their philosophy is that, you know, if you want to protect the Earth, you basically have to go and identify as many objects as possible. And while we have uh, facilities like the Vera Rubin Telescope, which is going to come online soon and start providing data, actually managing all that data, compiling it and predicting all the orbits, creating what is essentially a four-dimensional map of the resources and hazards in the solar system is a sort of counterpart point that needs to be performed, needs to be built out, and they've just set themselves the task of doing it. And they've shown that there is a rich bounty of undiscovered asteroids sitting in data sets that just needs to have the processing power applied to it to dig down into the noise and make the correlations between the images so that we can pull new discoveries from old data. I would call this computational astronomy, where new and more powerful computer tools are enabling the discovery of new things in old data. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.